Wow, that was crazy. Let's see if it's working finally. Whew. Better late than never, I guess they say. Um, I think we are finally broadcasting. We had a little bit of a glitch there. I had to reboot the whole system. And that takes a long time with this thing. And I had to reset a whole bunch of stuff. So I apologize for being a couple minutes late. But I guess they say better late than never. And, um... So, okay, Louis Brennan, how you doing? Jack, how you doing? Backwoods TV, how you doing? Chris St Step, Email Max, Cumberland Valley Outdoors, how's everybody doing? Uh, I apologize again for those of you who are just kicking on now. I had a, a glitch with the uh, broadcasting unit here and I had to completely reboot it. So that takes um, like five minutes to do. So. That's why I'm a couple minutes late getting started. I apologize. I also wanted to say thanks to Chris. Um, what was your last name, Chris? Bannister. Uh, I got an email from him on Monday. He also emailed Botec to thank Botec for supporting me. And Chris, thank you so much for doing that. That was very nice. Um, I also want to give a thanks to Bob Mergen uh, from New York. He did a project. Um, with some paracord on his tree stand and he made some keychains uh, with the excess stuff and sent me one So there's some paracord for my keychain. Thank you so much, Bob. Very nice um, So I don't want to waste a whole lot of time being that I'm a few minutes late give a couple more hellos here um, Dennis G, John Klopp, how's everybody doing? Josh, how you doing? Vital Point, howdy um, Travis, how you doing? Uh, so thanks everybody for tuning in. Also, thank you to those of you who sign up for the notifications, whether it's on my Sean's Outdoor Adventures YouTube channel, you know, you can go on there, you can get, um, click the little bell icon to get notified when I do an upload, but I've been posting these uh, live stream things at, at least a few days in advance, and there's a little thing that you can click on to say notify me when Sean goes live. So thanks for doing that. And those of you who are on that text message thread through Votech who you know texted uh, what is it watch to 313131 and you get those notices through that. Thank you to those of you who tune in from there. So okay um, tonight there's sort of a little bit of a theme going on for tonight. I've got a couple emails over the past week um, more or less asking me how do I balance hunting with my family life and or how if you don't have much time how do you deal with scouting during the season you know someone didn't have time because of work to get out scouting before the season so that's all kind of a same a similar theme you know you know integrating your hunting in your busy life or your family life and so that's kind of the, the topic for tonight but before we get into that, I want to do a live um, update and drawing for this map reading challenge. So I've been getting tons and tons and tons of requests um, on information on how to vote and things like that. So right now the voting is going to happen when we get that whole web page thing all set up. It's still in the production process. It's not finished yet. Um, when it is finished, I'll just make a live announcement or not necessarily live, but I will make an announcement on my channel that, hey, voting is now open. You know, I would expect it to be in a not too distant future, but I have absolutely no idea. It seems like I'm not sure. Like I thought maybe last week we were going to have it up and running, but you know how stuff can be. It takes, sometimes you got to, you know, get through glitches or whatever. So that's still being worked on in the background. However, the important part of the videos coming out, the individual scout trips, my forecast is to begin them on Monday of next week. Once they begin, I plan to air one every day for 12 straight days because there's 12 guys. So right now I'm going to change my camera angle over to the board here because um, if you watch the recent upload I had with the archery contest I did with these guys, there was, this is the list of guys in order who hit the, the closest to the bullseye. I have the actual target here that everyone shot at. Here's John Klopp, Jerry Knoyer here, Eric Arquette, Andrew Penzi, and Dan Weaver. They were the closest. Um, oh, wait, it's, and sorry, Aaron Jones is up here. So those six guys hit the target, or hit the paper at least. And so 
from the, the bullseye on out, this is the order that the scout trip videos are going to air. But we have six other guys who did not, either weren't there for various reasons, like um, Joe Mainville and Silvio. Uh, they could not be there, so they didn't even have a chance to shoot. Not my fault, um, and maybe partly not theirs either. Uh, and so uh, I still want them, obviously, to be in this. So what we're doing for them and the guys that just flat out missed um, is I have their names nice and big on this paper right here so that you can see it. I have a nice box. I'm going to fold these, crumple them a little bit, put them in this box, and we're going to draw them out. We'll say a little prayer. Hey, remember in the Acts of the Apostles after uh, they needed to find a replacement for, this is Sylvia, by the way, and the reason I'm crumpling them is so they don't stick together and it's easier to pull them out of the box. Uh, Steve Baum. What's up, Steve? Hope you're watching. Um, David McRae. If I can get these two. See, they're stuck. That's why I got to crumple them a little bit. Um, and then Corey Callen. Don't worry, Lewis. You're next. Lewis Brennan. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to, like the Acts of the Apostles, say a prayer and draw. Or they casted lots to find out who would be the replacement for Judas. But... Let's see here, the person who will come up as number seven in this is Steve Baum. Let me write a seven on here, I'm gonna keep track that way. And then I will, um, so Steve is gonna, his scout trip video will be number seven. Next is Silvio. Silvio is number eight. And let's see, Lewis. Lewis is number nine. I'm sure you're cheering right now, Lewis. And who is next? Joe Mainville, number 10. And who is number 11? David, oh, Corey, I'm sorry, brother. That puts you at number 12. So yeah, let's pull it out and make it official. My buddy Corey, number 12. So the 12th, it'd be like the 12 days of Christmas. On the 12th day of Christmas, you'll get Corey Cowan. Um, so that is the order, folks, that the scout trip videos are going to air. I'm sure people are commenting like crazy. I know Lewis and Andrew are on there. They're probably saying whatever. But that brings me to an important point. Those of you who are new to following the live shows, uh, I am a one-man show, and this is being broadcast all over the place. You know, Bowtech has websites and Facebook pages and all kinds of stuff, Excalibur, Diamond. It's going all over those places. If you're tuning in from one of those locations, I usually turn it over to question and answer at the end or when I'm finishing up. And if you have a question, go to my Sean's Outdoor Adventures YouTube channel because that's the only one I'm monitoring. Like I said, I'm by myself. I'm not able to monitor all of these feeds. So I'm going to be looking there for questions. And if you have a question, put a question mark at the end or even a couple. You know, make it so I can see that question real easily because. You know, being that it's just me and there's all kinds of stuff popping up in the feed, it's hard to find some of the questions sometimes. So give me some question marks at the end. That'll help me indicate, okay, here's a question and I can read it out and try to answer it. Um, I try to get to them as many as I can. Sometimes because there's so many things popping up, I miss one. So if, you know, if I've gone past your question in the feed and I'm reading one below yours, ask it again or you know save the questions till the end so when I say hey I'm ready for questions that's when I want you to put them up because if you write a question right now in the feed these these people are having conversations while I'm talking and so it'll get buried it'll get lost um, so there you have it so when I ask when I say we're ready for questions make sure you start firing away with the questions um, let me just see here uh, yes okay covered the things I wanted to. Now let's get into the, the two main topics and you can uh, you can rest assured I already have that copied somewhere else so I have the lineup of these guys. Now the, the two main topics I wanted to talk about tonight. Oh and this is a super important thing. I just I huh, my daughter started dance lessons at six o'clock on Wednesdays and as you know that's when I have this live show and it's be it's been very strenuous on us uh, to you know my wife by the way those of you who have followed the whole thing my wife had a bout with the kidney stone issue right before I flew out for that jewelry outdoors thing that I did like back in August and the earliest they could get her in for the procedure to basically remove it 
because it's not passing on its own, is tomorrow morning. So uh, keep us all in your prayers there. That'll be tomorrow morning. But also she has a bad back, ruptured disc in her back. And it's really tough for her to handle all four of our kids to take them to the dance thing. And so I emailed uh, my contact from Bowtech today, and I, or the other, actually, uh, yesterday, I, I think. And so we kind of worked it out. I'm going to move the live show to Tuesdays. Tuesdays at 7 is going to be the new time starting next week. So mark that in your calendar if you've been following these live shows. I'm moving it to Tuesdays at 7 uh, because of this issue, you know. And that's, that's part of our theme tonight is how do you handle, you know, uh, family life and hunting and getting it all to work out kind of smoothly. So mark your calendars from now on, Tuesdays at 7, at least for right now. And um, I'm actually not even sure, like when I was originally asked to do this live show, it was to help people get ready for hunting season. That's what they, they, they said to me. And actually hunting for us, most of my, me, a lot of my viewers, it's like this weekend is hunting season starts. So I'm still waiting to hear back from them. Like what is, what's the big picture here? What, are the, what do they want from me? Uh, and it's moving forward. So I'll, when I find out what that is, um, I'll let you know, but as of right now, I'm going to plan to be airing some episodes on Tuesdays at 7 moving forward. And um, let's start talking about our two main things for today. So one is how do I balance family life and hunting with hunting? Uh, because there's a lot of people out there who are have new families. They have children now. And one thing you need to realize, um, a lot of you, if you now have kids and didn't before or whatever case is, yes, you're going to have less hunting time, most likely, and it's because you have obligations. And so let's let's talk about how to deal with that. And to start off, I'm going to draw a guy here. Uh, this guy has had a little too much um, cake and maybe beer in the off season. Um, so he's ready for hunting season, though. He's got his bow right here. That's a that's a broadhead. And um, so here's our guy. And um, one of the things I want to just point out for you to keep in mind to help you keep all of this balanced is um, that there's really uh, two major components to us in a simple sense that motivates our, our decision. So down here we got our heart and that's like feelings. So we've got feelings, you know, and um, up here we have our thoughts. So, you know, when we go through life, a lot of the decisions we make are based on, you know, how it makes us feel. That's the reality for a lot of us. Now, hunting is something that a lot of us are extremely passionate about. It gives us an opportunity to feel connected to what God has created. And I think we all have a yearning for that in a certain sense. But to add to that, uh, when you are hunting, those of you who have been out there with a bow or a gun in your hand and an animal appears, let's say you're hunting deer and a deer appears, well, you have what a lot of people call is buck fever, which is an adrenaline rush, which we don't normally have that experience on a daily basis in other areas of our lives, which means this is something very powerful and influential in our lives. So we're connecting with nature, which is something I think we all yearn for. We're having this profound experience that's really impacting us here. And so the things that really positively or emotionally impact us in a strong way that we like or would like more of, it can really influence our thoughts. So let's just draw a little arrow. Now what can happen here, now you know me, I, I'm married, I've been married for 10 years, and 10 and a half almost, so hopefully she's happy. And now I've got uh, four little kids, I'm such a good artist, I know you, you're loving this. So this is what I've got here, and um, I have to realize that really my priority in life is to care about them. That's really what I am called to do. And one of the dangers that we have as hunters is we can let this hunting motivate us so much that we can um, at times put hunting before our families or, or make a divide, divider line between us and our families because of it. So I'm pointing that out so that you can kind of keep an eye on yourself to make sure you're not like causing a problem here 
because you're letting a lot of this influence your decisions up here. So we can we can do that. We can we can also like not listen to our wives when they're talking to us because we're so busy thinking about what our next hunting strategy is going to be. And um, or our kids may need us for something and we may neglect them again because we're trying to figure out how to get to the tree stand. So my point in just saying is for you to keep a balance. First of all, recognize this dynamic of how things can motivate your thoughts. So if your your hunting is motivating your thoughts a lot, just say, all right, you know what? I need to put the pause button on here so that I can keep a balanced life here. I need to give some attention to my family. And I have like, you know, when I'm during hunting season, when I'm home with my family, I just do my best to hit the off switch on hunting and I make a choice to block it out. I know I want to think about it and we're even obsess over the next tree stand location or whatever it is, but it's like, no, you know what? I, I have to do a good job at what I'm doing here. And if this is distracting me over here, I'm not going to do a good job. I'm going to be distracted here. And so my encouragement to you, if you're trying to find a balance, is learn how to hit the off switch to the best of your ability. Hey, that passion and desire is going to be there when you turn the switch back on. You don't have to worry about that. So just do your best here, and then everyone's going to be happier in the big picture. And I think when our spouses and our families see us making a real diligent effort when we're with them, you know, doing something with them, I just... Uh, you know, abandon yourself to the moment. Totally invest yourself in the, let's say you're going out, you know, hunting season's off to the fall and you have like a lot of these October fests and fall fests and like pumpkins and this, that, and the other thing, hay rides. Go for it. You know, go, just plan a day with the family and just totally abandon yourself to it. Have a great time. And that makes them happy, you know. And then I know for me, when I've done a good job there, my wife is like, hey, you know, get out there, get hunting. I know that's important to you. And boom, then I get to totally lock in on that. So it, there's a good balance there. But in order to have the balance, you need to sometimes turn the switch off to the hunting in order to, you know, do it. And the other thing, too, is if you have been doing a little too much over here with the hunting, and you, you would stay attentive to your family if you can tell that they're, they're struggling and getting restless or whatever, it might be time to, to call off and, you know, I was really looking forward to this hunt, but I'm just going to skip it. Let's just have a family day, whatever. So my encouragement to you is in order to have a, a good life in general is, you know, and keep that balance is learn how to recognize when your hunting is really influencing your thoughts and say, OK, I, I got to just I got to turn this off for a little bit because this is important over here. And there's people out there who are single, still in school, things like that. And maybe some of this isn't as big of an issue for you right now, but keep it in mind if you are, if you do end up married someday or have a family, or if you see your schoolwork is starting to uh, go down because of hunting season, you might need to use the off switch to get your homework done or get your schoolwork done or whatever. You don't want to you know, do poorly because of hunting, you know what I mean? Because, hey, let's face it, hunting is an extremely difficult industry to get into. Um... It's hard to get a TV show. It's hard to be successful on the internet. I mean, you look on YouTube and it is utterly saturated. Everybody under the sun wants to have a YouTube hunting and fishing and outdoor YouTube channel anymore. And it's extremely hard to get it to go anywhere. And there's a lot of you right now who are watching and like, yeah, it is. Because, you know, how do I get the views? How do... It's hard, you know, and it's getting harder and harder because there's so much saturation. So my point is, you know, a, a lot of us dream and wish and want to be professional hunters or to make a living out of this type of a thing, but very few of us actually will. And so we need to be realistic and be like, hey, I can't let this totally blow out my chances at other stuff. If I don't get the education I need to get the job, I need to have a living where I can still hunt, then, then I'm in trouble. So again, for those young people out there, who are still in school and stuff, you gotta learn how to hit the off switch a little bit and just, you know what, I gotta focus here and get this done. So those are just some ideas to help you, um, you know, in that balancing, and that's the whole thing. In life, we can become very unbalanced if we let, like, our passions overdo our, you know, over-influence our choices, because your feelings and your passions are unstable, 
Uh, you know what I mean? And so when it comes to this kind of thing, you need to have like you need to let your your thoughts and your choices be the governor. You need to keep things level. And in order to keep things level, you got to say, okay, my my passions are are really influencing my thoughts here. I need to just chill them down a little bit. My my passion's going to be there, but I need to say, hey, you know what? I I don't I can't think about that right now because I got other stuff to do. And I've got a friend. Um, and it, well, I'm not going to say any names, um, but a friend of mine said to me the other day that when it comes to this time of year, he has trouble getting his work done at work because he's thinking about the hunting. And, and that's, that's this right here. So if you're following this, brother, maybe this will help you get a little more of your work done at work. All right. So that's just a couple thoughts. Um, I had, like I said, some people reach out to me asking me how to keep a balance. And my hope is that that helps give you some ideas of, yeah, you know what? Okay. I can see that. I can see how my passions are influencing me, things like that. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is, you know, if you don't have a lot of time, work schedule, whatever, I mean, the only time you can get off is in hunting season. How do you scout? How do you get ready? And, um, uh, I forget the name of the guy who asked me that this past week, but this is for you. You know, this is um, this is to answer his question. So, let's think of your hunting area. Now, a lot of people hunt private land, and a lot of times I don't even think about private land because I just don't hunt much private land. So, for me, public land is fairly abundant in my area and some of the places where I hunt. So, um, you know, right out my back door is almost thirteen thousand acres of public hunting ground. I chose this house for that reason. Um, so I, I've got 13,000 acres to play with right out the door here. And where I've gone, you know, in other states, thousands upon thousands of acres. So the first thing I would say if, you know, if you don't have much time to do much scouting preseason, or if you're just not having a successful season and you want to mix it up, Try to just block off an area. Just say, you know what? There's going to be deer in most of these areas. It's not like the deer are completely not existent in one, one mile square blocks. It's just, you know what I mean? So if you have a giant forest, just take a section of it. You know, just, just take a square mile and let's picture first a place that you've hunted before. So if, you, if you've hunted this place in the past, obviously, I think having experience at a place it, it helps yield more success because you have some understanding of the layout of the land and what you've experienced there before. So let's say uh, the parking area is here at this particular location. You've hunted here and you've maybe seen one or two deer. You've been over here and you've seen a scrape during the end of the season. And once you decided to go all the way to the other end and there was some good trails over there. So here's what I would suggest. Let's say you haven't scouted at all. Out of your experience, in a, everybody who's watching right now, think of a place you can hunt that you've maybe hunted before but haven't been to in a while, if you can think of that. Maybe it's even someone's property that you hunted years ago or when you were a kid or whatever. Think of that property for a minute and, and practice this. So you, know, you have general ideas of where you saw some of the sign back then. Now, think, where could I, out of all those places, have the best chance of harvesting a deer if I went there today and I haven't been there since last year or 10 years ago? Um, okay, I'm thinking of a spot. Boom, I've got a funnel in my mind. Where I grew up, my parents actually, hi, Mom, Dad. They're watching right now. They've been watching all these episodes. Thank you. Um, but where they are, and they still live in the house where uh, they raised me. And down the road... I hunted this place. I could walk there, and there's a the tree line follows the road, and on the other side it goes down a hill to a cow pasture. So this was a couple hundred yards wide, and then it came down to a funnel point down here, a real narrow patch patch of woods that crossed the stream and went up to the other side. That funnel point had good trails going through the stream. I think I would sit there if I, you know, and I haven't been there in years. But because it's a funnel point and a place that would really, if the deer are going to move through there, as long as I got the wind in my favor, that gives me a good chance at a bow shot. So my first sit there, I would say, okay, I'm going to sit there because I think I would have a chance at a deer. Now, again, I haven't been there for years, but I know of a spot 
and it was across a few fields where I used to always see scrapes and rubs. So what I would do is, you know, let's say you, you've, all you've got is a morning hunt. You can hunt from dawn to noon. And, you know, come 9 o'clock, 9.30, 10 o'clock, you got to figure out how much time you have to do what I'm about to say. But let's say you have till noon and it's going to take you two hours to still hunt from this stand to that stand to there and back to the parking area. Then at 10 o'clock, if you haven't had any success, get down and start still hunting. If, you, if you're seeing deer, stay in the stand. But, it, you know, if you're not, um, get down and still hunt your way over to here, okay? Now, let's, let's say that in the process, you know, you might come across some fresh rubs that you never came across before. Or there might be an oak tree that you, you stumble across that you didn't kind of walk by there before. And, and there's a lot of deer sign under that tree. I carry a GPS. Um, I also have uh, my phones right here. And the people of Onyx Maps, they just um, hooked me and the guys up from the Map Reading Challenge. There's also apps, other apps you can use, but you know, with like Onyx or my GPS, I can put a waypoint in and save it. Like if I come across that stuff right there, that, whoa, whoa, look at these rubs. You know, I, I never was through this area before, uh, and I, I'm surprised to see that. I'm going to check this out, you know. Um, and so that's how you do it. Like if you need to scout during the season, try to incorporate it into your hunting, like after a morning sit, and then loop around. You know, work your way to that spot. And let me interject this. So I'm, do, I'm doing the map reading challenge and um, that we've been talking about that. And you know, you have a chance to win a Bowtech Rain 6 and an XOP area to hang on tree stand. And so do the guys because of the map reading challenge. But the map reading challenge is looking at a map, picking waypoints or, you know, picking spots and putting waypoints in and then doing this. You go out and do a scouting trip specifically to those waypoints and that's actually what I'm essentially telling you to do based on your experience at a hunting spot and I'll talk a little bit more about the map part in a minute but so what you do then is you go to the next spot where you've been before where you maybe encounter some deer sign and then you work your way back to the parking area now let's say you you had a great bit of sign and stuff here mark that in on onyx or your gps or whatever it is and um, huh, keep getting like my children. Well, my son is in in kindergarten now, and they have this automated phone call that they send out on Wednesday nights. And it, it just every one of these I've been doing, I've been getting that automated call, and I ask them to take me off, and uh, they're like, we can't. So now, hopefully, now that I'll be moving to Tuesdays, I won't be interrupted by that. That's what just happened right there. But anyway, um, you know, you put the waypoints in. You can go home and when you have a spare minute, like a lot of people watch TV at night. I look at, I study maps or actually edit videos uh, at night. I don't have time really to watch TV. But if you do, if you, you know, if it's a recreation time, everyone's just watching TV. You're not really talking, interacting. Hey, break out the, the phone, the GPS, whatever, and, and take a look at those waypoints and look at the terrain too, if there is any terrain and say, hey, why are the deer here? Was it because of the terrain? Was it because of a food source, travel corridor? What is it? And that's going to help you actually grow as a hunter as well. But now, let's say that's out of everything you looked at, that was the hottest spot. Um, how do you get to that hot spot without spooking the deer? What are the prevailing wind directions? Let's say this is the prevailing wind direction here. Let's say it comes from the west. Um, so the wind's blowing that way. Uh, you don't want to walk into the stand like this because your sense is getting blown this way. Is there a way for you to access from over here and, and sneak into that stand? And that's, that's how you get to be successful with minimal scouting preseason or, you know, even during the season. So that's what I, I would suggest to you. Also, let, let me just erase this for a minute and give you another example. Again, let's say you, um, you know, nothing's working out you know the spots that you've had in the past aren't yielding deer this year maybe somebody got a dog nearby and it just has pushed the deer out that's happened to me um, maybe someone else moved in and now someone else is hunting your hot spots that's happened to me and so it's like now what do I do okay now you got to push yourself and find something new 
and you haven't added it's the season's already going on you don't have time to you know pre-scout because the season's already going on let's just again um like for me i have a lot of public land so you can either pick you know farms or private property to try and go knock on the door uh, again that onyx map thing is nice um just mentioned because i'm i've been playing with it lately I, I never used it before and it tells you the property owner's name so it gives you a little okay okay i got a little insight here i can go and um try to talk to those people and or maybe somebody knows them or i know them like uh steve Baum. he um he's one of the guys on the map reading challenge when he saw who owned the one property he was interested in hunting, he's like, oh, I'm going to go talk to them because I've always wanted to hunt that stuff. So he got a little insight there, and that helped him out. But you can pick out some private properties and, and go asking them and then look at their property or just pick some, some public land and just pick a section. You don't, you don't have to go crazy. Like, what is a section that I can hunt that maybe not everybody else is getting to? And what I tend to look for is, let's say this is a piece of public ground, and there's a road that goes through it and there's a parking area here and a parking area here now uh, there are a lot of places i know like in like when i talk to andrew penzi in long island there's designated parking areas and only one person's allowed to park there and if somebody's there you, you can't hunt there that's like their spot for the day it's not like that out in, the, in rural pennsylvania or a lot of the areas that i hunt um, where I hunt, there's so much land and it's so rural. It's like, if you can find a place to pull your car off safely, you can park there. And so what I typically like to do is I start by looking at the map. So this is sort of like your own little map reading challenge. You're like, okay, I, my spots aren't working out. Maybe I got a chunk of public land I can get at. Um, how do I do this? It's mid season. What do I do? So I like to look at, is there areas that I can, that there's designated parking, or if you click on the aerial view, sometimes you can see like cleared out areas for pulling off. Well, let's say this is all of our public land. What, I what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna look in here, is there anywhere I can sneak my car off the road? You know, which is out of everything here, this puts me the farthest away from the parking areas. Which means if anybody wants to hunt this bubble here, they're gonna have more walking to do. I mean. It's going to be this bubble or, you know, these outlying areas, you know, those are going to be the harder parts to get to. And it's not always distance that makes it the harder part to get to, but, you know, there could be, and I don't have, let's see, my blue marker dried out, so I'm going to use red. But let's say there's a, a really big stream that cuts through here, you know, it might be, or eh, whatever, it might be so cut out. Like if you're out in like the Midwest... You know, these stream beds get so cut out, you sometimes can't cross them. I mean, it could be a 12-foot drop-off. It's not that way on the east because we have such a rocky under the soil, under the soil, so rocky, it doesn't get eroded out that way. But if, you know, if you have a stream, you know, this back here is going to be super hard to get to. Maybe there's private land over here. And again, like you can try to talk to the landowner, hey, can I park here and access the back? That's another thing I've done and very successful in New York um is is do that so but anyway look at this what is the hardest parts to get to from the parking area let me just take the stream back out for a second just to give you this what i'm saying so this bubble in the middle you know they're gonna have to walk let's say this is two miles you know so they're gonna have to walk almost let's say a mile to get to that middle spot in in there well this is this is a good bubble because not as many people are going to walk all the way to there if they can find good stuff here or here or here or here. And that's where everybody's hunting. Well, I want to find somewhere else. So again, getting full circle here, I'm looking for places I can pull the car off that, you know, if it's allowed, that not a lot of people are going to think that. Well, there's a lot of people who are just going to go to the parking area, get out and start walking around looking for deer sign. So um, this is where I'm going to start. Now, let's say... Um, what I would suggest if this is all, you know, all new is let's say you only have Saturday to hunt. That's it. You've got one day a week and it's Saturday. Go do a morning sit. Even if there's other people at your normal spot, if you think you can get in there and get a chance at something, sit there. Do a morning sit. But then when it comes to late morning, get down and go to this spot and park and say, okay, here's my goal. I want to get in there do a little bit of scouting and sit up for the rest of the day, you know, and 
What I would suggest is, you know, try to use the wind in your favor. Let's just say we got a west wind again. We got wind coming like this. I always use wind as a, dis a determining factor how you're going to do this. So if this is the bubble you're going to concentrate on because you're hoping that it won't get as much hunting pressure and the wind's blowing this way, end up here, but start over here. So park, maybe even drive real slow down the road and see if there's any good like deer trails crossing the road. Let's say there's a good deer trail here and a good deer trail here and that's it. Well, maybe get in there and it's never ideal to walk directly on a deer trail. A lot of times I'll try to still hunt alongside of a deer trail and to where I can see it and, and follow it. Maybe I'm only five yards away, but that five yards could be all I need to keep my scent away from the actual deer trail. If, if a deer comes through there hours later, and they stay on the trail, they might not smell where I walked or anything like that. So I try to stay off of the deer trail if I can. If it's too thick, and I'm just going to say, you know what, it's not ideal, but I guess I'm going to have to walk on the deer trail today. But I don't, if you can avoid it, avoid it. So then get in there, do a, a still hunt. And again, keep in mind that the still hunting is scouting at the same time, but be ready. Be ready for a deer to jump up and for you to get a shot. Or if you're quiet enough and slow enough, the deer just might be out milling around and you might see them before they see you and boom, you got a shot. So, um, in fact, um, Aaron Jones from the Map Reading Challenge tweeted, retweeted, do-it-yourself sportsman, Garrett, uh, he got a, a mule deer out in Colorado and I just watched this hunt. Congratulations, Garrett. I don't know if he watches these live feed, but if you do, uh, congratulations. Um, and he was, it was pretty neat. I kind of felt like it was God's providence. He just set up his camera to get a little B-roll footage of walking under this, this tree. And as he was doing that, he looked over and there was a buck, a uh, uh, mule deer. So he ended up getting a shot at it and kind of, you can kind of almost see it on the camera a little bit. So I kind of viewed it as like, that was pretty providential. That was pretty cool. So congratulations. But that's the thing when you're still hunting and I mean, when you're, you, if you're scouting while still hunting, you're ready because you could get a shot at any time. Um, and if you don't get a shot, I just view it as an opportunity to gain more information with the scouting. So kind of do this, you know, and then work your way around. Now, if it's a new area to you, I would suggest trying to, you know, rather than end up back here your first time in and then have a long way to go to get out in the dark, I discourage that. You know, if you find some good sign during the scout, okay, put that in your GPS or your phone or whatever program you're using and say, okay, maybe, you know, if this is a good morning spot looking at this, maybe next time I get a chance to hunt, I'll get in here before daylight, maybe bring a reflector tack, stick one in the tree you want to get in to help you when you get close. Even with the GPS, a lot of times the GPS will get you close, but it's like, oh man, where was that tree? And you know, stick one reflector tack right near there or in that tree and that'll help you. Okay, there it is. <laughs> you know, in the dark. Get set up. Maybe you're ready. That's your next Saturday morning sit maybe. But then come over here and set up to where you're not as far from your parking area if it's a new area that you can get back to your car a little bit easier, you know, at nighttime. So those are just some, some suggestions on how to deal with you know, keeping that balance in life and, um, you know, scouting during the season. Don't be afraid to do a little scouting trip when you get down from a morning sit. So I am going to now take questions. If you have questions, go ahead and start posting them up. I'm going to go back over to the computer here and field those questions and uh, see what we got. I'll take my camera arm, get me swung over here and uh, point this down a little bit. So let's see if we have any questions at all here. All right, I got okay, Tim. Thank you for all the question marks. I appreciate that. Hey, Sean, great video tonight. Oh, I'm, I appreciate you saying that because I wasn't sure if people were going to enjoy that or not. What is your take on UV brighteners and clothes, camo, spooking deer, and turkey? And are UV blockers worth it to use? Tim, I actually, after I, I turned off everything last week, I saw your question, so thank you for bringing it back. And I'm sorry I didn't get it last week. Um, to be honest with you, uh, you know, maybe turkey are sensitive with the, with the eyesight, but I've never had any issues with deer and the UV thing. I mean, this is just me, but I've kind of viewed it as, uh, you know, people are trying to sell products. And if that's something that helps sell the product, then they're going to 
focus on that. But honestly, I've never had any issues with deer due to some kind of a UV issue. Never, you know. And um, maybe there's people who have, but I, I don't really, uh, for deer, I don't really feel like they are sensitive to it or, or that it's an issue. And um, of course, I hunt in a tree stand a lot too. If you're on the ground, I don't know. Like, I don't have a valid way of testing it, you know. And so, based on what they show on these commercials and other things, like it's like, eh, whatever. But I have just never had an issue. Whether I was walking in in the dusk or you know, right at dawn, or in my tree stand, I've never had an issue. So, personally. I don't feel like they're necessary. I'm not, I'm not worried about putting them on my clothes or not putting them on my clothes. That's just me. I don't think it's, it's a huge thing. There might be people that go, oh, you got to have it, but I'm not one of those people. Okay, so it looks like we've got more questions here, and the thing is scrolling. Let me make sure, let's see if I'm, make sure I'm not missing any. Okay. Uh, good thing about being retired, you can hunt every day of the season. All right, Jack. Okay, here's a question. For morning sits, how long before dark should I get to my tree. That really all depends on the deer movement in your area. So for example, if I want to hunt behind my house, the deer move through there before daylight. I mean the first deer that are going through there are before daylight. And if they spook and snort, all the other deer that would have came are going a different way. So I literally would be in my tree stand, set to go, sitting still, by four in the morning when I was hunting out back here for a morning sit. And I'm talking about when it gets daylight at almost seven because those the first deer are moving through right after, you know, 4.30 and on, they were moving through. And if you didn't beat them there, you would ruin the entire morning. So um, that was out back. Uh, when I was on the Maryland Map Reading Challenge, um, I, would, I did a morning sit last year in Maryland, and I got down and I walked through an area, and I came upon some deer at 11 in the morning. And then um, this year, one of the guys that was on the Maryland group, I said, hey, you know, I checked out this spot last year, and the deer were moving through there at 11. If you want to go try it, here's how to get there. So he went there, and at 11 o'clock... The deer, uh, he wasn't ready for it. I guess, I don't know if he was, what he was doing, but the deer stepped out at 11 and I think he ended up spooking it. My point though is that particular area, the deer by habit may just move, mingle through there around late morning. So for a morning sit, you could be getting to the stand at 9.30 with plenty of time before the deer move through there. If you're going behind my house, you got to be there by 4.30 in the morning. So you just have to figure out what time of day are the deer moving in the area that you want to hunt, whether that's with trail cameras or years of experience. Like if you're going in and the deer are snorting and blowing out and then you're not seeing anything the rest of the sit, well, maybe you got to try getting in there earlier and see if that makes a difference. Okay. Best terrain to hunt the rut. Uh, Johnny, I think that, you know, for rut hunts, flatter areas are better. Now I live again on a mountain and where I tend to see the rutting sign scrapes and rubs is on your flatter areas. So you know on a ridge top you know where the hill crests and goes down the other side a lot of times I'll find rubs and scrapes on ridge tops because it's a lot flatter than the sides of the, the hillsides. Now where I live it's very steep hillsides and you're going to see a lot of that in the Appalachian uh, line going down, even through Virginia and, and on down, you'll see some steep hillsides. So when I can find benches, so if a hillside's coming down and then there's a, a, a area that flattens out a little bit and then goes down again, those bench areas flatten out. Because you gotta think, deer have to breed. And it's gonna be easier for a buck to breed a doe on a flattened out area than on a really steep hillside. So I look for flattened out areas and terrain during the rut. Um, Uh, okay, okay, Sean, have you ever had a deer that you shot that ran onto private land and you didn't have permission to access? What do you do? What did you do? I've never had that issue. Um, the closest I've had is when I used to guide out in Illinois. Sometimes we would have a hunter shoot a deer that would 
run over onto someone else's property or come onto ours. Typically what we would do in those scenarios is wait until the hunt is over. You don't want to go walking out there. You know, if someone's hunting that land, you don't want to go walking out there without permission for one, but also when it's still prime hunting time. And that's what I was just reading. Someone else said, don't be the person who's tromping through the woods at prime hunting time. Um, so you don't want to be walking out there looking for your deer and then getting somebody all upset. So wait till the hunt's over. You know, if it's nighttime, wait till dark. If it's in the morning, wait till, you know, midday, like noon. And, uh, you know, if it's the rut, you might have a little more difficulty, but then go to the landowner. Just say, hey, listen, I was over there. I, I hit a deer. It ran onto your property. Do you mind if I go get it? Some states have, you know, have regulations that a lot for people to be allowed to go and get that deer. Other states do not. You know, you have to have permission to go on someone's property regardless. And if you don't have permission, then basically that person's choice could waste the deer and that's out of your hands but you know but definitely go and ask permission if you you know have i've got i'm running out of time here let's see um sean what's your thoughts on the hex suit um i don't know i mean i haven't really researched them too heavily and so i'm not really sure you know I, i'd have to look into it a little bit more i'm not sure about that one that's all i can really say um, I've, I'm just about out of time, so let's see if I can get to one more question here. I see, uh, oof, I'm scrolling down. There's, there's quite a bit of uh, questions here. I just lost my spot. How high do you hunt in your stand? I like to be at least 18 feet off the ground. Um, I'm usually in a climber, so 18 to 22 feet is the window I'm usually in. I don't usually go a whole lot higher than 22 feet, but I like to at least be 18. Um... Let's see. This thing does not scroll very friendly. Okay. Great live stream. Thank you, BNBH Outdoors. What's your favorite time to hunt? Morning or evening? Thanks. Um, I would say my favorite time to hunt is in the morning because then you have all day and daylight to track and deal with the deer. I would say some of my best successes have been in the evening. This is an evening buck. 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 This is a morning buck. You know, um, morning, morning buck, uh, morning buck, evening buck. So I've had a lot of evening bucks. I'm looking at my buck wall and my racks are all over there. I've had a lot of good success in the evening, but really if I have my druthers, I love getting them in the morning. So I apologize. Listen, um, there's more questions and I'm out of time. I need to get off because they have, um, they have another uh, show coming up. Uh, so again, next week, 7 o'clock on Tuesday, and we'll, we're going to try that out. If you can make it, I would love that. If not, don't worry. It'll post afterwards. Thank you once again for tuning in. Um, Mapperty Challenge stuff is going. I mean, the voting is coming soon, and the videos, the individual scout videos that we talked about earlier, um, they're going to start Monday. So line up, get ready to share your favorite guy's videos and help him run up his score to help him win the Botec and also his team to win the XRP Air Raid Hang On Tree Stands. Thank you so much again for tuning in. God bless you all. All those who are still battling from the hurricanes, our prayers, I continue to pray for you, and I hope you're doing well and you're getting through it okay. God bless you all. And if I can get this to work, there it goes. Take care, everybody. God bless you.